I felt the alternative media was doing a decent job covering and commentating on the Jade Helm exercise and that's why I've been monitoring instead of posting on this subject until I came across these two documents. Now this paper goes on to say in the summary that the United States has tra traditionally kept military action and civil law enforcement apart, codifying that separation in the Posse Comitatus Act of 1878. On the other hand, it goes on to say, Congress has occasionally authorized the DOD to undertake actions specifically intended to enhance the effectiveness of domestic law enforcement through direct or material support. First is the 1033 program, the Department of Defense Support to Law Enforcement, a paper put out by the Congressional Research Service Department, which their slogan is informing the legislative debate since 1914, hmm, a year after the criminal Federal Reserve was brought into play. The act goes on to explain that there it, cod it is codified an American tradition of separating military from civilian affairs. Congress has occasionally authorized the president to deploy military force to enforce or assist in the enforcement of various laws, such as permitting the president to call out the armed forces in times of insurrection and domestic violence or authorizing the armed forces to share information and equipment with civilian law enforcement agencies. This support includes making available any equipment, base facility, or research facility of the Department of Defense to any federal, state, or local law enforcement official for law enforcement purposes. This program provided the necessary stepping stone to militarize the police in this country and blur the lines between military and peacekeeping forces in the United States. Keep in mind that this 1033 program is a direct offshoot of the NDAA goes on to explain that those participating agencies initiate requests for material. The DLA, or Defense Logistic Agency, retains the final authority to determine the type, quantity, and location of excess military property suitable for transfer and use in law enforcement activities. Now, can anybody tell me how MRAPs, armored personnel carriers, assault weapons, sound cannons, and frequency weapons are in any way suitable for use amongst the general civilian population in America. Program participants. According to this paper, which was published and released on August 28th of 2014, there are currently 11,000 law enforcement agencies registered nationwide and 8,000 are currently using property provided through the program. Now let's look at material accountability. The state coordinators are expected to keep property accountability records. Hmm. Like they were expected to keep under Eric Holder's Department of Justice Fast and Furious program investigate any alleged misuse of property and, in certain cases, report violations of the Memorandum of Agreement to the DLA. Goes on to say that some of the equipment offered to law enforcement through the program, such as weapons or tactical vehicles, possess significant military cap capabilities. By law, these items cannot be released to the general public and ownership is never transferred to law enforcement agencies. Rather, they are considered to be a loan. Well, in the words of Hillary Clinton, what difference does it make? They have these, these um, military grade equipment and they are employing the use of this equipment.
and probably towards the end of this report, and I'll place a link for it below in this video, one of the most troubling aspects is under the congressional reporting requirements. And it states, and I quote, the statute does not require any regular reports to Congress on the 1033 program. And then I came across this, Executive Order 13684, the establishment of the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. And I'll just go over some of the high points in this, and I'll leave a link below so you can read it in its entirety. It's only a page long. It says, by authority vested in me as president by the Constitution and the laws of the United States of America, and in order to identify the best means to provide an effective partnership between law enforcement and local communities that reduces crime and increases trust, it is hereby ordered as follows. Section 1. This is established a President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. Section 2. Membership. The task force shall be composed of not more than 11 members appointed by the President. The members shall include distinguished individuals with relevant experience or subject matter expertise in law enforcement, civil rights, and civil liberties. Well, who would that be? Eric Holder and Al Sharpton? Paragraph B, the president shall designate two members of the task force to serve as co-chairs. Section three, paragraph A, the task force shall, consistent with applicable law, identify be best practices and otherwise make recommendations to the president on how policing practices can promote effective crime reduction while building public trust. Now we're going to also look at how this is a main component of this Jade Helm exercise. Paragraph D, the Department of Justice shall provide administrative services, funds, facilities, staff, equipment, and other support services as may be necessary for the task force to carry out its mission to the extent permitted by law and subject to the availability of appropriations. Well, first of all, to the extent permitted by law under Posse Comitatus, this is not permitted by law. The integration of military forces with constabulary peacekeeping forces in the United States. Section 5, Termination. The task force shall terminate 30 days after the president requests a final report from the task force. Translation, this can go on indefinitely. And paragraph C under section six, general provisions, it states insofar as the Federal Advisory Committee Act as amended may apply to the task force any functions of the president under the act, except for those in section six of the act shall be performed by the attorney general. Now this interim report on the president's task force on 21st century policing was released and published. It initially came out on March 1st and then was revised again for publication on March 4th of 2015. Now, in the introduction, it states that in light of the recent events that have exposed rifts in the relationships between local police and the communities they protect and serve, on December 18, 2014, President Barack Obama signed an executive order establishing a task force on 21st century policing. Well, I think part of the rift that's been caused, you will find a direct correlation between the militarization of police and the distrust and um, fear of the general public in the militarized police force. Pillar one, building trust and legitimacy. 
Building trust and nurturing legitimacy on both sides of the police slash citizen divide is not only the first pillar of this task force report, but also the foundational principle underlying this inquiry to the nature of relations between law enforcement and the communities they serve. As I mentioned before, this is a key aspect in the Jade Helm exercises. For the last two, two decades, policing has become more effective, that's arguable, better equipped, that's not, and better organized to tackle crime. Despite this, Gallup polls show the public's confidence in police work has remained flat. I would argue that it's on a downward trend. And among some populations of color, confidence has declined. This decline is in addition to the fact that the people of color have felt the greatest impact of mass incarceration. Pillar 1, paragraph 1.1 under recommendation states, how officers define their role will set the tone for the community. As Plato wrote, quote, in a republic that honors the core of democracy, the greatest amount of power is given to those called guardians. Only those with the most impeccable character are chosen to bear the responsibility of protecting the democracy, end quote. Law enforcement cannot build community trust if it is seen as an occupying force coming in from outside to rule and control the community. Well, isn't that what Jade Helm is all about? And um, one of the task force members, Susan Rahr, wrote, in 2012, we began asking the question, why are we training police officers like soldiers? Although police officers wear uniforms and carry weapons, the similarity ends there. The missions and rules of engagement are completely different. The soldier's mission is that of a warrior to conquer. The rules of engagement are decided before the battle. The police officer's mission is that of a guardian to protect. The rules of engagement involve evolve as the incident unfolds. Soldiers must follow orders. Police officers must make independent decisions. Soldiers come into communities as an outside occupying force. Guardians are members of the community protecting from within. Now, although I agree with <clears throat> some, more than a few of the action items and recommendations presented under Pillar 1, I think we'd be hard pressed as a society today, given the cultural breakdown we're seeing all around us, to ever see these policies put into play and enforced. Although this presents a very rosy picture on how they intend to heal this problem, there are still a lot of flies in this ointment. For example, under Pillar 2, data collection, supervision, and accountability are also part of a comprehensive systematic approach to keeping everyone safe and protecting the rights of all involved during police encounters. Hmm. Does this clause actually support the NDAA data collection on every American citizen, every American in the country for future use? Paragraph 2.1 recommendation, law enforcement agencies should collaborate with community members to develop policies and strategies in communities and neighborhoods disproportionately affected by crime for deploying resources that aim to reduce crime by improving relationships, greater community engagement, and cooperation. The action item under that recommendation is that the federal government should incentivize this collaboration through a variety of programs that focus on public health, education, mental health, and other programs not traditionally part of the criminal justice system. Well, didn't the SS do that in Nazi Germany? The incentivization there was you turn somebody in and your family has the security of being safe. Paragraph 2.10, recommendation. Law enforcement officers should be required to seek consent before a search and explain that a person has the right to refuse consent when there is no warrant or probable cause. Furthermore, officers should ideally obtain written acknowledgement that they have sought consent to a search in these circumstances. Don't we already have that right under the Constitution? 
Paragraph 2.1. Uh, doubt one recommendation law enforcement agencies should establish search and seizure search and seizure procedures related to the L lesbian gay community and transgender populations and adopt as policy the recommendation from the president's HIV slash AIDS task force to cease using the possession of condoms as a sole evidence of vice. Well, isn't that also the isn't that practice also a violation of the constitutional rights we have already in effect? Paragraph 2.12 recommendation law enforcement agencies should adopt and enforce policies prohibiting profiling and discrimination based on race, ethnicity, national origin, age, gender gender identity slash expression, sexual orientation, immigration status, I beg to differ with that one, uh, disability, housing status, occupation, and or language fluency. Isn't there already a constitutional law already on the books that provides for that protection? So why is there the need to, to start rebuilding the wheel here? The question should be, how is it that we have slipped so far from the rule of law in this country that there is an actual need, as purported by this um, paper, to reinforce the laws that have already been on the books for a couple of hundred years? Pillar three, technology and social media. Paragraph 3.1, recommendation, the U.S. Department of Injustice, in consultation with the law enforcement field, should broaden the efforts of the National Institute of Justice to establish national standards for the research and development of new technology. I wonder what this could be referring to. These standards should also address compatibility and interoperability needs both within law enforcement agencies and across agencies and jurisdictions and maintain civil and human rights protections. Well, how are they going to accomplish that? when they're establishing standards to be using these types of social media, communication, messaging systems to conduct their work. That is an invasion of privacy, in my humble opinion. Paragraph 3.3.2, action item. The U.S. Department of Justice should create toolkits for the most effective and constitutional use of multiple forms of innovative technology that will provide state, local, and tribal law enforcement agencies with a one-stop clearinghouse of information and resources. Well, don't we already have that now? And I think they're called threat fusion centers. And let's look at this section, paragraph 3.5. Down here on table two, it says, what types of social media does your agency currently use, meaning law enforcement agency, and what types of social media do you plan to begin using within the next two to five years? Look at this. The percent of responding agencies currently using the agency website, 100%. Facebook, 82%. Twitter, 69%. YouTube, 48%, and LinkedIn, 34%. So they're already using your social media vehicles for, it looks like gathering, collecting information on the general community. Pillar four, community policing and crime reduction. Paragraph 4.5. <clears throat> Excuse me. Recommendation. Community policing emphasizes working with neighborhood residents to co-produce public safety. Law enforcement agencies should work with community residents to identify problems and collaborate on implementing solutions that produce meaningful results for the community. 
This sounds a lot like turning every citizen into a cop. Paragraph 4.5.4, .4, action item. Law enforcement agencies should adopt community policing strategies that support and work in concert with economic development efforts within the communities. This almost sounds like protectionism. Pillar five, training and education. This pillar states that the need for understanding, tolerance, and sensitivity to African Americans, Latinos, recent immigrants, notice there is no distinction between legal and illegal, Muslims, and the LGBT community were discussed at length at listening sessions with witnesses giving examples, blah, blah, blah. Well, the point is, is that uh, understanding tolerance and sensitivity should be given equally across all races, religions, sexual preferences, whatever. These are the wedges currently being used in society to divide us amongst each other. I have to say that um, under Pillar 5, almost every recommendation and action item involves the or surrounds the involvement of the Department of Justice. I think until we clean up that cesspool known as the Department of Justice, they should be pulled out of this equation completely. And Pillar 6, Officer Wellness and Safety. Although I can't take issue with um, many of the action items and recommendations put forth herein, I want you to remember this. The road to hell is often paved with good intentions. And now this brings us to Operation Jade Helm. The request to conduct realistic military training, Jade Helm 15. What is RMT? It is training conducted outside of federally owned property, i.e. the civilian population. The RMT uh, process is designated to ensure proper coordination between the DOD representatives and local and regional authorities. That would be the police, the sheriff, possibly the fire department, the process includes the following measures, risk assessment, medical and communication plans, legal review, the identification of training staging areas, role players, otherwise known as crisis actors in other stage drills and exercises, airfield drop zones, demilitarized zones and landing zones and surveys. Letters of invitation, blah, blah, blah. Coordination with local state and federal law enforcement. So this is a melding of military and police activities amongst the civilian population. And the participants, I'm sure we've all heard about this, uh, Army Special Forces, uh, Navy Special Forces, U.S. Air Force Special Operations Command, the U.S. Marines, Expedition, U.S. Marine Corps Expeditionary Units, 82nd Airborne Division, and interagency partners, i.e. local police and law enforcement. And I'm sure we're all familiar with this map. Okay, uh, impact on the, on the area. Over 1,200 service members will participate in Jade Helm 15 throughout Texas. What to expect? Increased military presence. Well, I think that's obvious. Increased aircraft in the area at night may receive noise complaints. Some individuals may conduct suspicious activities designed to prepare, prepare them for complex environments overseas. Well, isn't that what we have bases for? Training bases, training facilities? 
Local law enforcement organizations are fully aware the exercise local footprint will be 60 to 65 personnel. What you're, we're to believe you're conducting a realistic military training exercise with only the use of 60 to 65 personnel in states the size of Arizona, Utah, Nevada, and other areas they're going to be conducting this exercise in. Some participants will be, uh, will be wearing civilian attire and driving civilian vehicles. Safety measures. Safety for civilians and exercise participants is our number one priority. Uh, yeah, just like in the Boston uh, bombing drill, Sandy Hook, 7-7, 9-11, and the list goes on. But take a look at this here. Clear marking of exercise, get over here, exercise participants, use of keywords to determine exercise participation. This is a covert exercise. Coordination with local residents, both verbal and written, Fire conditions reviewed prior to each scenario. What types of fire scenarios are they attempting to be conducting during this exercise? Fire extinguisher and other equipment located at each site because safety for civilians and exercise participants is our number one priority. And then it gives all the contact information. I have contacted a couple of these people and received no response. We're all aware participating states currently include California, Utah, Colorado, which recently opted out of the exercise, Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, and Nevada, with the addition of Florida and Louisiana slash Mississippi providing additional support for unconventional warfare or asymmetrical guerrilla warfare training. And this, this is a term typically used to describe persons or civilians of a country or region who choose to fight back against occupation from within or without. Now, in information published from quote unquote official sources, uh, claims are made that there will be only anywhere from 1,200 to 1,600 special ops soldiers participating. Now, I ask, how are so few special ops personnel supposed to achieve any meaningful results in an area that comprises 25% of the landmass of America? My guess is that there are a lot more troops that will be participating in this exercise. And I also have to raise the question, when has a military exercise or RMTs of this scale ever been conducted among the civilian population of the United States. Not only are these RMT exercises to be conducted primarily during the hours of 11 p.m. to 4 a.m., the primary focus is on identification and extraction or rendition of insurgents, simulated live fire, the prevention of the migration and containment of civilian populations in designated holding areas. In other words, the restriction of civilian movement outside of the exercise area, setting up DMZs, and most disturbing is the refinement of the US AWC's war tactic entitled Mastering the Human Domain, No Turning Back, which basically states, quote, Interdependent is traditionally a joint service team defined as the purposeful reliance on one service's forces and another service's capabilities to maximize the complementary and reinforcing effects of both, the degree of interdependence varying with specific circumstances. Now, what do we see happening with this exercise? They're relying on the interdependence of local law enforcement organizations with the military. 
The issue as I see it is they are also involving civilian law enforcement in these exercises and exercises an exercise in force majeure, combining and coordinating military and domestic law enforcement to control a local or regional civilian population. I thought this type of activity was specifically prohibited under posse comitatus, as we saw and as was addressed in the papers we discussed previously in this video. But so what, right? No one's paying any attention to the Constitution or Bill of Rights anyway anymore. In a press release pub published by the U.S. Army SOC website on 3.14.15 to belay concerns of the public by stating that, quote, while, while multi-state training exercises such as these are not unique to the military, the size and scope of Jade Helm sets this one apart. To stay ahead of the environmental challenges faced overseas, Jade Helm will take place across seven states. However, Army Special Operations Forces will only train in five states, Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado. And as I mentioned before, I do believe that Colorado's uh, state governing authorities have opted out of this exercise. The diver diverse terrain in these states replicates areas Special Operations sol soldiers regularly find themselves operating in overseas, end quote. Now I ask you, from a common sense standpoint, does, is, does this explanation hold water? The human domain with respect to this exercise is defined as, quote, the human domain is the totality of the physical, cultural, and social environments that influence human behavior to the extent that, and that success of any military operation or campaign depends on the application of unique capabilities that are designed to fight and win population-centric conflicts. It's a critical and complementary concept to the recognized domains of land, air, maritime space, and cyberspace. And what did we just read in the President's New Executive Order 13684 and Program 1033 in the new 21st Century Policing, they are going to dominate on, the, on those fronts. Quote, we know and project about the future operating environment tells us that the significance of the human domain in future conflict is growing, not diminished. Goes on to say the service leaders wrote, one controversial tool to aid in the collection, processing, and analysis of information in regards to the human domain has been the U.S. Human Terrain System, or the HTS, which, in which social scientists primarily anthropologists, have been utilized to conduct research and provide analysis to military commanders in support of the military's operations. At the height of the program, there were 30 HTS teams in Afghanistan, and despite the challenge of the program, it was widely viewed as providing value. Now, let me interject here and just say that Jade Helm is not a new concept. They used Jade Helm 13 in Iraq and in Afghanistan in order to win over the hearts and minds of the people. So it went from George Bush, they hate us for our freedoms, over to winning over the hearts and minds of, of the civilian population. The Army Times goes on to explain that currently tools such as PMESII, or Political, Military, Economic, Societal, Infrastructure, and Information, <clears throat> through to the Excel spreadsheet that they have in the article in the British-issued Human Terrain Packs, can provide valuable tools to begin the collection and processing of human domain information. Is that what we're actually seeing in Obama's 21st century policing. 
The fact that they are asking permission from local authorities is ludicrous, as this is not a new strategy, as I just mentioned. <clears throat> and we can see how well winning over the hearts and minds of the people in Iraq and Afghanistan in 2013 worked out. When you invade a country and start murdering its citizens, you can expect resistance from the civilian population. And is that what we're about to experience? I don't know. I hope not, but I'm afraid <clears throat> that that play may be in the cards. So my question is, if they've already run a real exercise of Jade Helm in Afghanistan and Iraq in 2013, why is the need to replay this again among the civilian population here in the States? We've seen all too often how these drills or exercises have gone live. Another thing is that on all the printed documentation I've found states that the exercise will be conducted from uh, July 15th through September 15th. However, if you listen to this audio of a Mr. No Rank Associated with his name Thomas Mead, who is one of the Operation Jade Held planners, states more than once that the operation is to conclude on September 11th. The activities that are going to occur in Brazos County will occur between August 15th and August 21st. The, the actual length of the exercise goes from about July 15th until September 11th. We'll end on September 11th and head back to home station. 9-11 and not September 15th as put out in the publications. Was this a Freudian slip or does he have information that the exercise will conclude on the 11th of September? And why are all the major players in this SOCOM exercise entitled Mr. with no military designation? Even retired military tend to identify their rank, you know, in, in quotes or parens, retired. I, for one, am very concerned about this event. Um, it's unprecedented, unnecessary, and forbidden under the Constitution and Bill of Rights. Will they take down the internet as part of this exercise? As clearly, the domination of air, land, maritime, space, and cyberspace are one of their objectives. Will there be a real or simulated cyber attack on the banks during this exercise or something much worse? Recent history tells us this sets up the classic problem-reaction-solution scenario to impose a tyrannical agenda on the American people. <clears throat> well, I hope this may have connected some of the dots for some of you guys out there. And if it does, great. If it doesn't, oh well. Um, I've put all the links to the information I've provided in this video below. And please share this video. Please get this out to everyone. Thank you.